Make sure you pray for Brother Marty. He's not feeling too well. I kept looking down at my thing saying Brother Marty was getting ready to sing. I kept looking back there and he wasn't moving. So I guess he didn't have a voice to sing. And in that, yep, yeah, all right. So, and uh, we have a lot of illness going around. I know that uh, Dr. Scheidler had to go to the doctor today. And uh, Amanda's not here this morning, uh, or I guess not even this evening. So, and uh, so there's a lot of illness and stuff going around. And, uh, and again, yeah, these are our brothers and sisters. And uh, uh, just sometime this week, uh, look around at people that aren't here. Just give them a phone call. Send them a little card. Just let them know that, that you missed them. And uh, it's always uh, good when people care about you. And uh, I like to be cared about. I like for uh, people to notice if, if uh, uh, something's going on with me. I enjoy having prayer and uh, uh, said for me. So uh, let's do that for one another. And uh, because all together we are brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. And uh, we certainly can show our love that way. Now you guys are going to have to do something for me. You guys all have to just practice smiling. Let's start over here. Move over this way, okay, a little bit. Okay, looks a little bit better. I realize people are tired, and uh, maybe you didn't get your nap in today, and uh, I'm sorry, and, uh, but let's, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Now's not the time, and uh, uh, in that, it's time to open up God's Word. So let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes, if you would, please. Book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, written by the wisest man in the world, and uh, uh, bar none. And uh, a very familiar passage of scripture uh, in that. And if you would, let's stand together and we'll read uh, down through uh, verse uh, number uh, 13. Sorry, verse number one. I tell you what let's do. I'll read the odd, you read the even, and we'll go down to verse number 13. So I'll start off and uh, you guys get the evens, I'll get the odd. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to rend, and a time to sow. A time to keep silent, and a time to speak. What profit hath he that worketh in that therein he laboreth? He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And also that every man should eat and drink and rejoice uh, and, excuse me, and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and goodness to us. We certainly thank you, Lord, for uh, Jesus Christ, Lord, him coming, Lord, to die for us and to make us brothers and sisters in Christ. And we just pray, God, that you would just help us, Lord, to, as we look uh, at the stewardship of time this evening, Lord, that you would help us to understand that every moment we live here on earth, we need to be doing something Lord, for you uh, in and through our lives. We ask this in your precious name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Now in Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10, it says this, the days of our years are three score and 10. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet their strength uh, labor and their sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So basically, if you look at that, it says our lifespan for the average person is three score and 10 or what? 70 years. Some of you are getting close to that line. Okay. Some of you have, have far exceeded that line uh, in that. And, uh, but three score and 10 uh, is what the psalmist is telling us. Benjamin Franklin said this. He says, doth thou love life? And think about it. Do you love your life? 
And this was the advice he gives. He says, then do not squander time, for that is the stuff life is made of. Another person wrote this, said, you inherit over uh, one half million. Uh, in fact, your inheritance averages out to be 573,415. No, not in dollars, but something more important. It's time. The average person lives approximately 5,700, uh, excuse me, 500, uh, 573,450 hours. You ever thought about that? It's a lot of time. And, uh, but your hours are running low. How do I know? Because mine do too, is what he said. Then uh, Sir Walter Scott said this, when you kill time, remember, there's no resurrection when it comes to time. When you kill time, you ask somebody, what are you doing? I'm just killing time. You can't ever get that time back. You can't ever get that time back. Uh, now the, somebody averaged something out for says, if you live to be 70 years, you will spend this in time. You ready? 20 years sleeping, 20 years working. Sounds fair. And uh, in that, uh, six years eating, seven years playing, five years dressing. This one is awfully skewed. One year on the phone. Obviously, this was made before cell phones came out. And because uh, one year pff, uh, of time in your lifetime, no, that's not enough nowadays. Two and a half years in bed or lounging around. Three years waiting for someone, for some of us, maybe more. And uh, uh, five years trying to tie your shoes. Two and a half years uh, of other things, including one and a half years of your lifetime are spent in church. Now, to spend one and a half years in church in a relative lifespan of 70, you must, in, in the day of, uh, from the day of his birth, spend five minutes each morning and five minutes each evening in devotions and then spend three hours a week in church to get that hour and a half. Now, some of you say, well, I've gone to church all my life. I guarantee you, you haven't gone that much. Not from the time that you were born till now. Maybe some, some have. Now in our scripture reading this evening, we have recorded for us uh, some words that the wisest human that ever lived uh, penned for us. He put in perspective for us this subject of time. And he said, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. In other words, when you were born, you were born with a purpose. There's no mistake for you being on this earth. Now, uh, your mom and dad may have said, well, we only plan to have two children, but we have four. You weren't planned. You may have not been planned by them, but you were planned by God. Every human being that walks the face of the earth was planned by God. And you in particular, if you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and personal Savior, you have a, a purpose for being on the face of this earth. Now, Solomon in his lifetime discovered that there was one who keeps the world in order, and that is God. You want a really interesting read and do an interesting Bible study? Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Here you have a man that had everything because he was so smart. He, he, was, he started out in his life honoring God, and God blessed him with great wisdom, with great wealth. He, he had everything. And as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, you could see how miserable he was. And having everything because he stopped living for God in his life. And he became miserable. God blessed him with many things. He stopped living. But also as he is writing uh, here, he said there was one who can uh, cause all things to happen in its seasons and gives everything a purpose. It is evident from the explanation that God's character is that he is all-knowing. Is God not all-knowing? Yes, he is. That's one of his attributes. He knows uh, the end of everything, and he also knows, um, and, and all that is done is controlled by his providential hand. Now, all the events of history have been fitted into God's timetable. The fact that God is immutable or unchangeable and unaffected by the circumstances of the world is incomprehensible to the human mind. You ever thought about that? It's just, we, 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 we just can't grasp that. Uh, but the only way uh, that Solomon could find true happiness was in knowing what, uh, that God's providence in all the events can be worked out for his purpose. Now, last week we started talking about stewardship. 
And we've talked about how steward, a steward is somebody who, who owns nothing but manages something for somebody else. You know what? Everything that we have, every second of the day, the bodies that we have, the mind that we have, the abilities that we have, truly belong to God. And as stewards, we need to uh, use those abilities that we have in God's time uh, and, and for God's purpose. Um, what I want us to look at is how we use our time. Now, like I said, each and every one of us was born with a purpose. Each of us have been given the gift of life uh, here on earth and for eternity. Now, each of us had received uh, the gift of the physical birth from the Lord. It tells us in Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 through 16, this. For thou hast possessed my reins, and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members are written, which are in continuous, are, which in continuance are fashioned when they were yet none of them. You ever thought about how special your body is? How it functions? We're okay with our body till something gets hurt on it. Then all of a sudden, we pay attention to it. You ever, you ever broke a toe? I mean, you break a toe, your whole body hurts. Okay? You ever had a toothache? The most miserable pain in the world. Just have, tooth pain, face pain is the most miserable pain to me in the world. But I think it's, it's really interesting that when you go in for surgeries or you, you study medicine, how intricate our bodies are, how special they are and how they function. I mean, I can't tell you why I wake up every day. I don't go to bed thinking, I hope I keep breathing. I just do. God gives us rest. You know what? I've taken a lot of pictures of places that I've seen all over the world, but they're no more beautiful than the picture my eye sees of them. Pictures never do justice to the things that I've seen. They never do. Because God made the, this lens of our eye so special. The fact that we can talk and communicate is something that is just incredible, isn't it? And even if you can't, somebody came up with sign language. And I, I, I enjoy watching people that know sign language, especially when they start talking fast. I have no idea how they know what they're talking about, but they do. They can communicate. I remember going to visit a cousin of mine who had Lou Gehrig's disease. The only way he could communicate to you is by blinking his eye and typing out messages on a computer. It took a little while, but I enjoyed talking to him that way. I still remember his, his brother, who isn't a believer, really doesn't care for the things of God, asked me, said, can you go by and check on him to make sure he's ready to die? He died not soon after my mom did. And I was able to go over there and my dad had witnessed to him and he had come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's a great thing. But God gave us a body to use for him. And with that body that we have, and with this mind that we have, God has given us direction of what he wants to do with that. But if you can communicate and you can talk and you can think, you're well ahead of a lot of people on earth. Boy, walking is something special, isn't it? Have it taken away from you for a while. You really appreciate walking. You really do. Have, have one of your senses taken away from you and getting it back. Like when you have a cold... And you can't breathe, you think you're never going to be able to breathe again. If you're cold free right now, go. <sighs> There's some people that can't do that. Isn't it nice to be able to take a breath? You ever thought about it? I mean, God gives all of this stuff to us. Because he's given us life. He gave you life. Have you ever thanked him for that? Now, maybe your life isn't what you think it ought to be, 
but God gave you yours. He gave me my abilities. You know, I, I wish that I could sing and play the piano and play the guitar and do all of those things. I can't. But God's given me other abilities, like being an obedient husband. And uh, I, I have that ability, and I, I try my best at that. But, but with that, God also gave us not only life, but God wants to give us life eternal. If you have a pen and paper, I want you to write some verses down. Because I'm going to take you through how you could lead somebody to Christ by talking about what God did for us eternally. Uh, uh, turn to John, uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, we have uh, the, the story of Nicodemus and Jesus. And uh, it tells us starting in verse number 1. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. They, he recognized the fact that there was something special about Jesus. Now, John had life, and he, and he was even a person who had studied the Word of God, but yet he didn't understand what it meant to have eternal life. God wants to give us uh, something to be, uh, he wants us to be born twice. So Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean to be born again? Nicodemus asked him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? We know that's a physical impossibility, okay? There's my beautiful wife. There's my only child that's in church tonight and uh, in that. And, uh, uh, but look at him. S stand up. Honey, stand up. Do you think she wants to give birth to that again? <laughs> at his size. Now, that's the question that John was asking. How can a man enter to his mother's womb a second time and be born again? He didn't understand the question. You may be seated. You know what? There's a lot of people that under, don't understand what it means to be born again. They don't understand what that means. They don't understand what it means to be saved. Saved from what? They need it explained to them. And so Jesus starts explaining. He says, Verily, verily, uh, I say unto you, except a man be born of water, that's the physical birth, and of the spirit, that is our eternal birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. As I was growing up, and uh, my dad got stationed in San Diego, I remember we went to Grace Baptist Church in Chula Vista, uh, California. And in red letters right across from where in our auditorium where the preacher uh, preached was that verse. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. I remember sitting there as a, as a fourth grader reading that over and over and over again, trying to understand it. I'd been in church. I'd, I'd heard that. I'd made a profession of faith. But I was trying to, to grasp with that, what did it mean? You know that each of us is born with a sin nature? The Bible tells us this. First verse to write down is this, Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You know what? When you talk to somebody uh, about their salvation, you don't have to, to do too much convincing for people to realize that they're a sinner. People know that they do things that are wrong. Now, most people have heard of the Ten Commandments, and they know that there are just certain things that just aren't right. You don't have to tell a kid that a lie is wrong. They understand that it's wrong. People understand when you take something that doesn't belong to you, it's stealing. Even if they think they need to have it worse than you. They know in their mind because God puts it inside of us. We have a God consciousness inside of us. And so you could take them to this verse and say, you know what? Sin into the world, death by sin. So death is passed on all men for all have sinned. All of us are sinners. Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. To come short of something means to not have enough. Just like in our illustration this morning, that little boy who wanted his boat back, he had to come up with a dollar. He didn't have quite a dollar, so he worked until he got it. You know what? <clears throat> we come up short uh, when we try to pay for something ourselves and we don't have enough. Well, there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves 
to pay for our sins. Somebody had to make a payment for us, and that came through Jesus Christ. Now, because of our sin, we will physically die. The wages of sin is death. Now, once <clears throat> we die, we will all stand before the judgment uh, of God. The Bible tells us, as is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. People understand death. People understand that they're going to die. Okay? They see it all around them. And, uh, and you can point them to the verse, Hebrews 9.27. Is you have an appointment with death. But after this, after you die, you will stand in judgment. Now, I don't know about you. I have never liked being in court. When I was 16 years old, I got a speeding ticket. And I had to go to court. And the judge was not nice to me. He didn't try to pamper me or anything. He let me have it about speeding. He chewed me a good one in that court I was very embarrassed to stand there I was standing in judgment before a judge one of these days we're going to have to stand before God the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 and 12 and 15 it says and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it and from whose uh, face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Boy, if you just stop right there, that gives us no hope whatsoever. Because he's going to be looking at the works. There's nothing that we can do. But there's another book that was there, the book of life. Now, God made a way for all of us to be able to stand before God in judgment. It tells us in Romans chapter number five, but God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we are saved from the wrath uh, through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled, uh, to God or bought back by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we are saved through his life. That's Romans chapter five, verses eight through 10. God made a payment for us. God came and died for us while we were yet sinners. It's my favorite verse. That word committed means demonstrated. He demonstrated his love for you and for me on the cross so that we could be saved. Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, for, for by grace are you saved through faith. It takes faith to get saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God has that free gift for us. You know what? When, when, uh, when it was Christmas time, there were presents under the tree. Some of them had my name on them. One of them was this really cool watch. It had my name. It had been sitting under the tree or been sitting somewhere. I didn't see it until the day that it was given me. Now, when did this become mine? When it was under the tree? When it was purchased? Or when I accepted it? It's when I accepted it. You know, a lot of people know that there is somebody out there that loves them. But until they accept that love, until they accept that gift, it is not theirs. This is what keeps a lot of people from heaven right here. People have a head knowledge, but they don't have a heart knowledge. And we want to try to drive them to this heart knowledge by telling them what it tells us in Romans chapter 10, verses 9, 10, and 13. How can we have a relationship with God? It tells us this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is open to all. It doesn't matter your social status. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. God died for all men. All of us are precious in God's sight. And he wants so much because he loves us to redeem us back to him. He wants us to be born twice so that we only have to die once. I will die a physical death. But after that, I'll be with God forever in heaven because I've accepted, I've confessed, I believe. How about you? 
How about you? Do you have that? Do you know that 100% sure? If not, it's never too late. But see, God gave us life so that we could follow the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. To preach means to herald, is to tell. It's our job to tell others. It's our job to try to get people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He has given us that privilege to do that. Also, each of us are held accountable of how we will use our time here on earth. Turn back to Ecclesiastes, if you would, but the last chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. In his writing, Solomon uh, uh, came to a conclusion after he wrote about all the... He tried everything in the world. You read the book Ecclesiastes, he, he, he tried uh, wine, women, and song. He tried everything, and nothing would bring him happiness uh, outside of God. And so then he wrote this. The very last two verses of the chapter said this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God bringeth every work into judgment and with every secret thing, whether good or whether bad. You know what? All of us are going to be held accountable for how we spent our life. The Bible tells us that we need to have respect for God. It tells us that we are to fear God. That doesn't mean that, that he wants us cringing and, and, and afraid that he's going to make us a little greasy spot in the carpet if we mess up. It just means that we need to have respect for him. We need to have respect for God. How do we have respect for God? Turn, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, we see Jesus talking uh, uh, to some Pharisees and Sadducees. And um, in that, uh, starting in verse number uh, 34, it says this, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put them, uh, and that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. And one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the greatest command uh, in the law? And Jesus said unto him, That thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. How is your love life with God? Do you follow the first and great commandment? Do you truly love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind? Because to love God is to show him through the obedience of our lives. To show, to show him in, in doing what he wants us to do. We need, in through our lives, with the time that we have, we need to show folks that we truly do love God. I remember somebody asking us when we were teenagers, if, if I was to accuse you of being a Christian, could I go amongst your friends and find enough evidence in your life to convict you? You ever thought about that? What if we pulled poor Dayton out and brought him up here? Could we find enough evidence? Could we, if we, we brought, come on up here, Dayton, let's, let's find out. Dayton, do you truly love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind? Let's find out. Turn around. Is there anybody out here that could say, I've seen Dayton live for God? One right there. Is there anybody out here that could say, <laughs> everybody's like, well, we had to look at him for a minute, okay, in that. Let's ask his mama. Is he an obedient son? Okay. He could work on that, that part, couldn't he? But for the most part, is he a pretty good kid? Usually he is. Okay. Let's ask his sister. Is your brother nice to you? Does he treat you well and fair? No, not at all. Okay. Oh, well, hey, she's saying no. But isn't that part of it? If we love God with all of our heart, aren't we supposed to treat other people? Well, you better say yes because it's the very next verse. Okay. <laughs> How about anybody in his youth group, any of his peers? Have you ever seen any evidence that, that he loves God and that he's trying to do right? Yes. Okay, there's one. How about you guys? Sure, yep, they're, they're all shaking. They're, they're like afraid. Yeah, I'm shaking my head yes because I don't want to be called up there. 
But do you see, see what I'm saying? None of us are perfect. None of us have been perfect sons. I joke about it. I wasn't a perfect son. I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect anything. But I am a forgiven one. I'm a forgiven human being that could live for God. You can be seated. Thank you. He's been embarrassed all week long. Okay, in that. But you know what? I know he's a good kid. I know he's a good kid. I watch him. He's not perfect. Okay? After all, he's a teenager. You're still in junior high, right? No. Oh, you're ninth grade? Oh, wow. You're getting old. And uh, in that. But we're to love God with all that we have. And none of us are any different. I could have brought somebody else up here. I could have brought an adult up here and we probably had the same reaction. But in our time and in our life, we're supposed to be having that evidence in our life. Not only are we supposed to love God with all of our heart, but the second thing is we need to have respect for others. Look at verse 39 and 40. Jesus goes on to say, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Now, do you love your neighbor like you love yourself? You say, well, I don't like myself. You don't have very far to go. And if you don't like yourself, there's something wrong because you're a creation of God and God created you just the way you are. So you might as well just accept it and be happy about it. But do we truly treat people like we want to be treated? Think about it. People in the Mike Express car wash line. Oh, I'm going to get up before that person. It says everybody merge. I was watching people just fighting for position. Like, dude, everybody's going to get in there. And uh, my biggest fear is that it's going to break down and I'm inside of it. <laughs> in that, I'm always happy when I get out. And uh, grocery store line. I mean, why do we have road rage? Because we think that it belongs to us. And I confess I have struggles in that area because I do think that I own the road in that. But you know what? God expects us, whether we're driving, whether in a grocery line, whatever we're doing to treat others than our, better than ourselves. So that's what the Bible says. It says you're to love your neighbor as yourself. It's just as important as loving God. And what did it say? On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So basically, the rest of the Bible, you get those two things right, you'll have no problem following the rest. Turn to 1 John, if you would, please. 1 John chapter number five. Not only are we supposed to have respect for God and respect for others, but our, res uh, but our respect for keeping and following God's word is so important in our lives and following what God wants us uh, to do in stewarding our life and stewarding our time is following what God's word wants us to do. Look at ver, uh, verse number one of chapter five, 1 John. It says, whosoever believeth in Jesus is, uh, whoever, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Every, everyone that loveth uh, him that be, begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do what? What are the last three words? Keep his commandments. How do we show love for God? Say it again. Keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not what? Grievous. They're not grievous. They're, they're, they're not hard to follow. This is simple stuff for us to do. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. We need to have respect for God's word. It says it's not hard. You know what? God's not sitting there with a ruler in heaven ready to bash us over the head every time we mess up. But we should be growing in grace, should we not? We should be more mature in 2018 than we were in 2017 when it comes to God in growing in grace. I've grown so much in the last 24 years being a member of Cornerstone Baptist Church. 
I'm different than I used to be. I'm a little bit more chilled out than I used to be. I remember pastor telling me, not everybody's in the military, Rick. You got to chill out. It's like, what do you mean? But I've grown in grace. And you know what I find out? The more that I grow in grace, the more graceful I am to other people. The more I come to understand that, you know what? Everybody are just sinners saved by grace. And we are all striving to do our best for God. And that people need grace and people need mercy. And we do. And there's a world out there that wants us to use our time wisely because we've been given life and we've accepted eternal life. And if we're going to have respect for God and respect for others and keeping his commandments, then we need to be out and about telling other people while we still have the time. Because not everybody has as much time as we have. Think about all those statistics that we said earlier. How are you using your 573,450 minutes of life or hours, I'm sorry. How are you using it? Are you living a life that truly shows that you love God, you love others, and you keep his commandments? And when you get a chance, you tell them about God's love. That's how we steward our time. It's not difficult, it's not hard, but it just takes time. Time is so precious to us. Let's make sure that we're using our time and stewarding our time wisely. Remember, it's a gift. It's a gift. We need to use it wisely. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. Tonight, our message is very simple. I realize that there's no, no, no earth-shattering news given to you this evening. But boy, I'm just telling you, the Bible tells us in the last days, perilous times shall come. We live in a sin-cursed world that needs God's grace so badly. If we've received it, then we know what it can do for us. We know how much happier we are. We know how much more at peace we are with ourselves and with others because of God's amazing grace. But what are we doing with our time to show others? What the world needs now are Christians to show love. More so now than any other time in history because I believe our time is short. Your families need it. Your friends need it. Your neighbors need it, and we need to be going about doing what God wants us to do. Father, I just prayed to be with this time of invitation. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace that you bestowed upon my life. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your, for your call upon my life, for allowing me, Lord, to study your word and to preach a message. And Lord, I just pray, God, that you would help me to be a good steward of my time. Lord, so many things clamor for my time during the day and there's so many distractions. But Lord, I just pray, God, that the number one attraction to my life would be living for you and loving others the way you do. Lord, you love others unconditionally, Lord, and I pray that you would help me to see others the way that you do. Help me to have your eyes. Help me to have your thoughts, Lord, towards others. Lord, just help us as a church body, Lord, to do the same thing. Lord, that you would help us to care about those around us and that we would do all that we can to get the gospel out to them and that we would live a life for our families and for our friends, Lord, that would point them to Christ. Just be with us now as we sing a song of invitation. We ask your precious name, amen.